We had five big chances, uh, absolute overload for us, and we only missed one of them. Wow. All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London Is Blue podcast. As always, here is Brandon, my co host, Nick. No, Dan, but we got Dennis, couch critic, joining us for this one, our Canadian brethren. Dennis, how you doing, sir? Feeling great, especially after seeing Chelsea emphatically win in a cup, semifinal cup, but we'll get into that, I'm sure. How confident were you when Nick said, hey, you want to jump on the pod ahead of this one? It was about to be a trap game for you. <laughs> Honestly, um, I was relatively comfortable with the position we're in, just being at home and knowing that there's no way players like Raheem Sterling, Cole Palmer are going to go in a cup semifinal and not produce their best performances. So yeah, I was quite confident, but you never really know with this team. That's for sure. Confidence, Nick, you hear that confidence. I was not as confident as Dennis, but I mean, few are, I mean, he's the coolest person that we know. So, I mean, he just kind of exudes confidence. Whereas I was, uh, really hoping that we, we showed up today. Uh, you know, it's, I, I hate these games after, any sort of break, whether it be international break or winter break or whatever. And, uh, you know, I was happy that the team came out and put on a show. That was awesome. Yeah. Well, look, we are here to talk about the dispatching of Middlesbrough uh, through Chelsea's terrific display on the day. Um, really just going to be all about the vibes today, boys, and uh, celebratory episodes. So uh, buckle in. This is what we're looking forward to. We don't get a lot of them, so we got to take advantage when we can because, hey, it's cup final time. I kind of wish we knew who we were playing. I almost wish we were the second legs so we could, like, incorporate that in. But, hey, Fulham and Liverpool are playing probably when you're listening to this, so uh, you'll know more uh, about who we play at this time. But, hey, we got to kick it off. Tradition, right? At, as we always do. It would be weird to not do it this way, but the 300 match review, which is really just our version of in case you missed it, and we get the crowdsource descriptions of the match. Three words is tricky, but here we go, Nick. We have quite a few good ones here, mainly Discord and Twitter. If you're looking to get involved, that's how you do it. Uh, Brad uh, with Chelsea Don't Carrick, which is, <laughs> is good. Uh, again, if, if I'm selecting them and you use puns, you have a 100% <laughs> chance of making it in. Uh Derek, uh, of course, with the Thurman effect, that's a big shout out for a member of our of our discord, Mr. Thurman, who uh, is exuding a little good luck uh, on the squad there, which is good. I told him to bring back a trophy because he posted on his Instagram the, the trophy cabinet. So I the, like this is connected. <laughs> More of our people need to go to the bridge for for big games. Uh, <laughs> our friend of the pod and F1 influencer James Coker was there today, too, and I told him he can't leave. So he lives there now, <laughs> and that's important to know. Um, Ch Chelsea FC in USA, job not done. Very Kobe Bryant, uh, which I respect uh, and admire. Uh, journalism RP with time for revenge. I think he's uh, looking forward to <laughs> a Liverpool Cup final p potentially. Um, Brent with 12, 11 win incoming <laughs> Chelsea and Liverpool, just, you know, again, a little, a little bit of projection there, but I appreciate that, uh, pillows, you know, close, close to all of our hearts, chaos, almost trophies. Yeah. We'll see. I think amongst, was that supposed to be amongst chaos amongst trophies? Yeah. Typo. You're throwing us off here. All right. Hey, it could edit be your work. <laughs> it, could, it could be either silver lining with bridge becoming fortress. Talk more about that. And Philip O'Neill with Warm Chilly Night. I really like that one, Philip. Mm -hmm. well, well well done on that one. I, look, Stoke the Flames. George A deserves better. All right. <laughs> Can't God. believe they Stop let him down. It. But because I know Stop that that it. would be very protagonist. Uh, Chelsea Wembley trophies. You Love know the it. drill, gentlemen. Run it back. That's what it goes every single time. So uh, I'm nah. going with Chelsea Wembley's trophies. Uh, Dennis, what about you? Honestly, I, I probably, I wish I would have came up with what you did. Am I allowed to cheat a little bit? I'm going to use a little <laughs> alliteration. But it, if you think of blown out as being like this one word, then it's just burl back blown out. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, the back a, line, you know, they got. Yeah. They got, yep. Come on. Okay. Yep. 
No, okay. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Yep. hundred percent. This is a family friendly show there, Dennis. Come on now. Fair, fair. Well, I'm at the back line. I'm hoping that you guys caught yeah. that. Yep. Uh, I went with the infamous Kesarasara. Whatever will be, will be. We're going to Wembley. Kesarasara. Yes, absolutely well played. Love it. Brush off the chance. Uh, Wembley, we're back, baby. So huge shout out to our amazing community who've leave the five star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It helps. It's free. Thank you. Uh, YouTube, subscribe and hit the bell. Kind of get notified because Jake, editor Jake, is now video editor Jake as well, putting a lot of time in there. Uh, would love it. You can check it out. See Dennis's awesome hoodie that he's rocking. And then obviously join the Discord for all the elite conversation throughout the week and on match days and the weekly newsletter. The London is Blue Dispatch from CFC Central. He does a phenomenal job. All these awesome ways to get involved and continue to support and engage with us. We appreciate all of you. But hey, it is time to jump into the match. It was Middlesbrough. This past Tuesday, midweek match day, the 23rd of January, in the League Cup at Stamford Bridge. In case you missed it, Chelsea 6 Boro one on aggregate six two absolute waxing. Uh, Dennis, get involved here. Run through the goals. I'm talking 15th minute through the 88th. Okay, so this might be a little bit tricky, but um, I think at the 15th minute it was Jonathan Housen that actually scored an own goal for us, uh, helping us along the line there. It looked like Broya got it at first, but uh, clearly it was uh, off of Housen, and then and then I think. It, Two nothing. It was Enzo finding his way into the box, a la Frank Lampard. The nice late run, finding mm-hmm. his his feet and just banging it into the back of the net. Love to see that. And then Axel De Sassi. I know we're going to be speaking on him later, but what a run and what a finish! Uh, wow, you know, um, just th- doing things that I never thought what he was capable of doing to make it three nothing. Then of course that man. We can't get to six goals without seeing one for at least one from this guy, Cole Palmer. Old Palmer, as everyone likes to call him these days, just again, high press, doing what he does best, steals the ball, bangs it into the back of the net, and it's four nothing there. Then again, another link up, and this is a courtesy of the Gal Dog there, Gallagher, running down the right flank there, or the left flank actually, and cutting it back to Cole Palmer, one touch finish, beautifully done, as only he can do, Cole Palmer. And then, uh, if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, seeing five go in, we got another one from Nonin Madweke, uh marauding down the right flank there. I'm not sure who set him up there. Was it Galdog again? Sure it was. Uh, yep. I think it was. Sure I think does. It was. Super yeah. sub. Yeah, coming on and doing the damage, and uh, we get to six there. And then I don't remember what happened after that. I just remember six going in, and then I just kind of turned it off. So I don't know where we left off. Pure bliss took over. That? Hey, you, you look there, there. And one more went in. All right. It went for Boro, but at that point, absolutely did not matter. Not even a consolation goal. So Nick, uh, set us up with the lineup and we'll jump into some stats. Yeah. We're going to talk, uh, in a bit about this lineup. Uh, but I will just l- list it off for you. And then Dennis has some, uh, theoretical physics on how this worked, uh, as we go into it. Uh, Georgie Petrovich, big George in, in goal, of course. Uh, ben Chilwell, captain of Chelsea Football Club, playing, do my eyes deceive me, left back. Unbelievable. What a concept that, that's happening here, that Ben Chilwell, one of the world's best left backs, is actually playing in left back. That is phenomenal. Levi Colwell uh, playing Tim, Tiago Silva, and Axel Di Sassi make up the rest of the back line. Enzo Fernandez and Moises Caicedo make up a familiar midfield. And then it's all loud attack. From there, uh, Mudrick, Palmer, Sterling, Broya. Uh, we were curious to see kind of what, what combination that would entail. Brendan and I both uh, guessed different people heading into this match. Turns out we were both right, and uh, one of us was more right than than the other, which we'll get to later. Uh, we had subs of Noni Matueke at halftime for Mudrick, Gilchrist in the 65th minute for Chilwell. Obviously, just coming back from injury, got to manage those minutes. Connor Gallagher also in the 65th minute for Broya. Uh, Carney Chocomeca making another appearance in the 72nd minute. And then Brandon, ya boy, Leo Castledine coming in in the 85th minute for Raheem Sterling. Uh, other unused subs. Ted Kurd 
making the line, making the lineup. <laughs> Unbelievable. Ted Kurt, it's it's Brandon's favorite goalkeeper. Uh, Le- Lucas oh, okay. Bergstrom also making uh, the lineup. So your classic two goalkeepers again. <laughs> um, you know, sure. Benoit Betty Ashiel on the bench and uh, David Washington also there as well. Uh, look, for what we had available, I think it was about as you know powerful and attacking as it could have been, and that's what it was. So uh, that 17-year-old Ted Kurd, for all of you keeping track at home, uh, Chelsea, you tweeting me when two goalkeepers are on the bench, but one of them is 17-year-old Ted Kurd for the first time. It's a hilarious gif. Hmm. All right, it's not it's bad. It. The Alonzo morning, like, <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. Not bad. Uh, so that is fun to see for him. I mean, share the share the 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 love. I mean, we're just putting in goalkeepers to to fill slots at this point. But some of the top line stats, all this come from SoFa Score. So if you got questions, you go right there. Sixty two percent possession, a thirteen shots, six on target three off target and four block shots. Boro, on the other hand, had dribbles, nothing. They had four shots, two on target, none off target, and two blocked shots, which was phenomenal for us. Uh, just the one off sides to their six. Obviously, they got the goal called back towards the end there that that uh, played into our favor. We had five fouls apiece, so again, very tame match. Um, and then lastly, we had five big chances. Uh, absolute overload for us. And we only missed one of them. Wow. Unheard of. Someone check on Sam right now because <laughs> I don't know if he knows how to process that. All right. Um, that was always his favorite thing to tweet. We've now taken it away from him. So, like, what is he going to come up with? Uh, Sam C in the WhatsApp. Excited to hear. Uh, from there, we had 10 shots inside the box. High, high quality. Uh, only three outside the box. And then Petrovic only had to make one save. Obviously, give up the, the goal. But overall, Chelsea uh, with a 3.38 XG bagged six to Middlesbrough. 0.12 and they bagged one thanks to the at XG philosophy. So that's a lot. But does does 3.38 seem low to you? Yeah, actually it does. Like a lot of our shots were in the box, like yeah. and not particularly well contested shots. Like, I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but I you know it's not like we were scoring from outside the box with you know free kicks or anything. You know, it just seemed like you know, fluid moves I mean, and I don't really know how they calculate it, so um, it's hard for me to really know how they come up with these numbers. I just look at it and I'm like, three point, what was it, three point eight? I'm like, three point three. Yeah, I thought that we scored six, and most of them looked like they were definitely going in the goal and definitely should have been, you know, with a high carry a higher xG. But I mean, with Chelsea, who knows these days? You know, like they're probably thinking that you know the goal, the the own goal was probably going to go wide, and uh, Madueke's one was probably going wide just knowing how Chelsea are. So, um, yeah, three point three eight seems low to me, but I'll live with it if we put six past him every time that happens. For sure, I think uh, again you're going to have to go shot by shot, and I just honestly haven't done it. But with six on target knowing that 10 shots were in the box, how many of those were on target and we had three outside the box. So maybe only three of those inside the box actually were on target, which is where you kind of get those discrepancies. But guys, who cares? Like you both ended your your questions on that. Yeah, who cares? All right, absolutely buried it. We love to see it. But we saved the best stat for last and it is the one random stat from at OptiJo10. Chelsea have now reached the final of the EFL Cup for the 10th time in their history. Only Liverpool, 13, have reached the final more times in the competition's history. Regulars absolutely love it, especially as people love shitting on the Chelsea right now. Hard to doubt the pedigree when it comes to silverware, Nick, Um, which is where we need to be, where we need to get back. A lot of quotes on that, but you had an MPET shithouse moment of the match, so we got to make room for this. we got to let it breathe, give it space. Rare that it's the manager, but uh, taking Mudrick off at half uh, in a 4-0 winning environment is uh, <laughs> is cold as hell, and uh, I, I think that was a message uh, intended to get across. Uh, I'll put it that way. We'll talk more about Mudrick later. All right. Well, hey, we're going to take our first ad break. When we're back, uh, we're jumping into the fireworks and what went down. Thank you to the sponsors, and we'll be right back. 
All right, so um, fireworks at the bridge is Chelsea do what they were supposed to do and advanced to the League Cup final. Um, look, w- there were expectations around this match. I think you guys were talking about a little bit before the pod. The fallout, if Chelsea were knocked out by mid-table championship, Nick, was real. And you and I even kind of talked about it on our Monday pod of like, hey, We don't think it's going to happen, but we are aware of what it's going to be like if it does. From the player's perspective, outplayed Boro. They picked up fresh injuries. They weren't at their best. They just played Saturday. We weren't sure if the break was actually going to be good for Chelsea or bad because we hadn't been in that competitive state for a while. Okay, we're good. (laughs) On to the next one. No concerns. Yeah, I mean, I think contextualizing this is important, right? Because the narrative heading into this was if Chelsea win, expected. If Chelsea lose, season off the rails, Poch potentially, you know, looking down the barrel and the season seemingly, you know, in terms of stuff we could win, probably about over. And I think that's a really tough place to be um, because – you know, of course, Chelsea are favored in this tie, you know, and, and I think at the end of the day, the the true co- quality did show through the aggregate score. I mean, this this Middlesbrough team is nothing special. They're kind of an average championship side. They're not particularly great at any one thing. They don't score goals for fun. They're not ex- exceptionally gifted defensively. Their goalkeeper is among the very worst that I've ever seen uh, play football. And... Chelsea shit the bed in the first leg. And so it put a ton of pressure coming home to do a job. Now, Chelsea did a job with a plum today, um, which is great. And even, you know, Naz and Matt and a bunch of folks were like, well, that's a huge pressure release valve enacted right there. You know, you make the final like you should. And, you know, it seemingly are taking some momentum, right? You know, outside of losing to borrow earlier in the month haven't lost since but you know before that to wolves back on christmas eve like the team's starting to maybe figure out some stuff right so i i think contextually dennis that's where i start this one is like it was a tough place for us to be and the team came out flying yeah absolutely um that's that's a good place to be and when you I think you did a good job of outlining where we're, we were coming from and, you know, where we are right now. Um, obviously, all through December, Chelsea have been quietly collecting points, quietly. You know, nobody would have thought that we were, like, second in terms of points accumulated only to Liverpool. And so that's that's a good place to be. It shows me that this team is starting to round into form, starting to play some football that may not be the prettiest on the eyes, but it certainly is reproducing the results that we want to see. So that's a good place to start. But with this match in particular, like I tweeted it out earlier, I was kind of like just looking for an opportunity to learn something from this, the character of this squad. I wanted to see what kind of characters would show up. You know, um, obviously, in a you know semifinal second leg at the bridge, you know, late, you know, you know, the evenings at, at the bridge, we've all been there. We've all seen it before. We know what that feels like. And to see the squad, you want to see your, your best players and your brightest stars you know, rise to the occasion and produce a performance that's conducive to winning. And, you know, it's it's the first time, I, I know we're going to get into what what the actual outcome was, but it was the first time that I went into this match feeling like, yes, we should be able to see some character come to the fore. We, we should be able to see this team show some, you know, some real quality because we do have it. It's just now, are we able to like, number one, show a bit of consistency, And number two, just score goals. Like, what is the difference between last game and this game? The fact that we had three or four opportunities in the first half of the first game that we didn't take. Then you look at the the second game and, yeah, of course, we scored goals. That makes all the difference. When you score one and then you score another one, the confidence grows and then you score another and score another. When you miss one and you miss another, the confidence just starts to, like, you know, deplete and whatnot. And I think that that was a perfect example of what we saw from the first leg to the second leg. So. You know, great performance there, but you know, we just we just got to continue to build this consistency and use it as like a spearhead for the rest of the the, the campaign going forward. Well, Poch uh, signaled his state 
before this, and it uh, came across as calm, right? Whether he was just trying to play it off as cool um, or he did feel confident, he came out and said, quote, tomorrow is the biggest game of the season because it's our access to the final. We need to be convincing to be able to win. It's the possibility to play in and win a final. It's a good pressure. I like this type of challenge. We want to be in that situation and play in semifinals. I think tomorrow's game is really important because it's the possibility to win a trophy. In a personal way, I'm so excited for the game. It's a way to play at Wembley, a final, and to have the possibility to win a title. I'm so motivated, and I try to translate the players how good it is to play a final and to play in Wembley. He, he also said this, and, and I think we felt this too, that because last season was such a disaster in so many ways, that there was added pressure on this, right? Because, you know, everyone's been so unhappy for so long. And, I, you know, again, I, I think it's an easy thing for him to say because he wasn't here last year, right? But I, it doesn't make it any less true that, you know, I think there was a, I don't know what's going to happen with this team today sort of vibe. And that's primarily due to that. But after the game, uh, you know, I think he's saying more Chelsea manager type of stuff, Right. In some points, it's an amazing achievement because it was an objective when we started because we are not in Europe to build a team from nearly zero. It was an objective to be at Wembley in February. It's an important step for us, for the confidence and belief in ourselves. That's going to help because the motivation of players who are close to returning to the team, wink, mm. they are going to want to come back and be a training to borrow because of the final. I am desperate to win a title here. We won three trophies in Paris, and we want to win one here. I am desperate to win trophies, of course. Notably, um, Spurs not necessarily a, a winning proposition. Um, but Brandon, I, I like this is more like it for me. This is more not couching everything. I want this shit bad. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, this is Chelsea. Uh, this is what it's all about. Like they're at the highest level. This is the thing that not everyone can get. And the fact that our offense just went in, this is exactly what I said, right? In our match preview, in port, part of the last pot, I was like, we have to go out there and bury Middlesbrough and let them know that, hey, there are levels to this game and you aren't there. And I felt like that's exactly what they did. And, uh, you know, thankfully we didn't have to wait too long to get that goal. And the fact that it was an own goal, I think that probably hurt even more. And so... Everything played perfectly. And I think from there, their heads started to drop, and we kept just pinning them back, pinning them back. And then obviously in the 30th, 29th minute when Enzo got his goal, and the way it came from, again, having so much success on that flank, uh, cutting back, Ooh. wide open, slotted home, it, it just it set the tone, and that's exactly what we wanted to see. And so um, preparation, plan, execution, all three parts looked like they were there and in sync, and that was the best part of it. I mean, look, Dennis, first half, eight shots, four on target, four goals, right? Three big chances, yeah, all goals. <laughs> that's what you want. Like, we finally produced a result that is indicative of the golf in class that Chelsea should have versus Musgrove. Like, it's just that simple. You know, like, we, we should be battering a team like this with the amount of talent that we have in this squad. And the reason why we haven't been, obviously, we don't take our chances nearly enough. Different story today. And, of course, I don't want to I don't want to harp on it, but we can't ignore the fact that we have a really, really young squad. And some of the details that it takes to win games like this coming into these matches, they just haven't learned that yet, right? We don't have enough experience to know how to get through, you know, tough, tough matches. You have to learn that and build up that sort of, like, muscle. And it's only until, you know... I was thinking, again, I don't want to just uh, deal with the, the rest of the season because I'm so excited about what we've been able to do in this particular match. But I've been saying for the whole season that it's going to take some time for this squad to start to realize what details need to be focused on to win matches. And it's now, you know, December into January right now, we're starting to see the squad starting to take that sort of shape and starting to see results. Obviously, the health helps as well. We're getting people back. And losing them again and getting them back and losing them again. Let's let's not dwell on that too heavily. But yeah, it's just now the ideation starting to come together. Guys are starting to understand what the manager is asking of them. And, you know, the repetitive nature of being on the training pitch week after week with the same manager, with the same instruction is starting to seep in. It just takes time. And 
again, I'm just glad that we finally produced a performance that is indicative of the quality that we have on the team right now. I, I think it was an interesting attack too, and in, in both phases because it was very clear that Middlesbrough sent out to congest the middle. Right. They didn't mm-hmm. want Chelsea's midfield to get really going. And, you know, first like three or four minutes, Chelsea found it difficult. And then Chilwell and DeSassi push up, provide extra uh, width to the attack. You've got Sterling going, you know, Mudrick doing a little less, but still, you know, playing a, a useful foil. You got Palmer ducking in and out of the attack. And you have Enzo, who's, you know, again, we've given Poch a lot of flack for some bad game plans. Enzo being deployed is at like eight stroke 10 advanced up the field, making late darting runs was genius because they couldn't account for all the numbers. Right. And so if you then begin to spread out because you're getting killed on the wings and they know that they don't have the athletes to compete with Chelsea's, you know, wing play, then you get those central runs going again. And so game plan was an a plus execution of the game plan was an a plus you, know, you look at the second half, it was a little more subdued, but you still got a couple more goals, five shots, two on target, two scored, one big chance missed. I mean, you called this out, Dennis, you're the aggressive attacking shape. That to me is what it was. Like there was just no mercy. It was, okay, you lose the ball, you get it back, and you restart the thing. Absolutely, and it was no different, I would say, in terms of a setup to what we saw at Fulham. We were very, very aggressive against Fulham as well. I mean, the results were different, but the approach to the game, you saw fours and fives inside the box consistently throughout that game, consistently. You're getting the runs from Enzo. You're getting the runs from, I mean, we can consider, I guess you can consider Palmer as a number 10, but to me, he was coming deep a lot of the time to collect as well. So I would say he was another advanced eight, you know, very similar to how Enzo was used in this game. And we had so much box presence, so much box presence. It's funny Because for the amount of box presence that we had, the one person that I felt was muted in the whole attack was the striker. Like, I didn't feel like we got anything from the striker today in terms of, like, giving us some sort of offensive thrust. We can can get into it, but, like, I'm just saying I didn't really feel him in the game. I didn't feel him as much as I wanted to. And that was mitigated by the fact that we had so many other people in and around him that were able to get into those dangerous areas and cause you know, havoc. Like, they were having so much trouble dealing with those runs into the box. They're having so much trouble trying to cope with the the width that we're producing uh, out wide. And then, of course, the cutbacks. How many times did Chelsea get down to the byline and cut it back to a wide open midfielder? It just happened time and time again throughout the game. So, again, um, game plan was well executed, as you said, Nick. But also, I think that just the understanding on the pitch is starting to really start to take shape and whatnot. And I don't know about you, Brandon, but I felt like every time we were in the ascendancy in the match, it felt like it was very calm and collected and composed as we attack. Well, it also helps when Boro gives you two goals, maybe on the night. Uh, and that's helpful, right? They can t- look how many times have we been so frustrated that we've like played out of the back and when we're under immense pressure, Boro did that today. They're like, look, we're not changing. We're going to do our thing. And like Carrick is the head coach, you know, former United player had a lesson learned tonight. It didn't work out. It, there was time to adapt and he didn't adapt and he wanted to die by the sword, Nick, and they died by the sword. Uh, when you look at mm-hmm. the average positions of this Chelsea squad, uh, we literally just threw four at the attack, right? And created those overloads You'd, you'd get someone to mark, they would move someone out of position, then whoever else from the outside would, would run in between and, and make that. Chilwell was free all 60 minutes he was on the pitch, which was a brilliant overload and reminds us, fullback overloads are delightful. We should do more of that. <laughs> it's almost as if playing a fullback in the fullback position can work. now Because his, his other perf- uh, appearances under Poch were as a winger. As a winger, yeah. He had not played left back under Poch yet, not even in preseason. So, uh, yeah, it's it's been very interesting. But, yeah, I mean, let's start with him, right? Uh, Chilwell, coming back from injury, he had the little cameo right before the winter break. Uh, got 60 minutes tonight, off-ball runs, cross-field passes. Looked like absolute man on a fucking mission uh, Potch described him before kickoff as one of our captains and one of the best footballers in the country. 
hard to argue with that. And I don't know, man. I, I just... Two days ago when it was announced that Gusto was going to miss this one, I started getting all clammy because I was like, he's our only real fullback right now. We loaned Matson out. Uh, we sent Lewis Hall to Newcastle. Kukure is hurt, and Chilwell's just coming back. And what a breath of fresh air this was, Brandon. Like, I, I just – when I – when I look at this and there was a stat that was shared before uh, the game by, uh, I think it was by expected Chelsea or is by CFC daily, either one of the great accounts out there. I'll find it here in a sec, but there's only been 11 matches where Reese James and Ben Chilwell have played together since uh, the champions league win <laughs> 11. That's criminal. That is criminal. Uh, uh, expected Chelsea shared it. Yeah. 11 games with both of them. And, uh, 86 games since the start of the 2021, 2022 season without them. It's especially to have like your top players invest a lot. I was looking at the average age is, as, as we were running through the lineup, Nick and sofa score, they put the average, you know, underneath and whatever. And we're up to 25.4 years. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa hey, hey, who is this mature, <laughs> uh, well-established footballing side? Shit, that's what you get when you add Chilwell and Thiago Silva to this team because Chilwell's 27. And I was like, when did he turn 27 I thought he was 25, right? 26. But He's we've been injured the last three exactly. fucking years. So it's like, yeah. yeah. So that always like throws me off, right? And it was just like reminded me again how much we have missed him. Um, we know how good this team is and how dynamic and the overloads that are created. Again, uh, I think this is probably a great 60 minutes for him against Middlesbrough. Uh, he was able to have freedom. But look, he 50-50 with the goalkeeper early on. No problem. Pop back up. I was like, thank God. That was the penalty. litmus test for me. That's a penalty. That was a pen. That was a pen. It's a Cla fucking penalty. Clattered him a bit, no doubt. Um, so yeah. I think, like, good, right? Didn't overexert him. 60 minutes. Felt like a plan. We're in a good situation so we can move on. Um, but, yeah, like, let the chill well uh, nostalgia hit. Yeah, you know what though? I I just I just wanted to quickly touch on just something else about Chilwell, which I think is a credit to him as a footballer. I mean, he understands the assignment that's being given to him on the left flank. So that's why he can play the winger and he can play like the wing back and he can play the left back role. So I don't think that it's necessarily because Poch makes bad decisions. It's because it's very hard to pass on the instruction about what you want from that particular position a lot of the time. Like Certain guys aren't able to carry it out. So with Chilwell back, you can see that he understands the role. He was out there telling Mudrick what to do. You know, like he hasn't, he's barely been in the side. He's telling Mudrick what to do where he should be on the pitch. You know, he hasn't been in the team. So that's a credit to his understanding of the game and also just his ability, you know, so we, we've missed him, obviously. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Um, it, yeah, th this is the vibes that we're starting to get again. If we had our entire squad healthy, this would be a completely different team. But, hey, we know that. All right, we're going to take a last ad break. When we get back, it's all about Cold Palmer. I mean, this guy can do no wrong. So thank you to sponsors, and we'll be right back. I say can do no wrong, but, Nick, some people might remember the first leg. Some people, yeah. <laughs> Not these people. <laughs> I mean, look, hey, there is so much you can say about him, but I think – what I would call out about this performance is that he is just finding himself in the right positions at the right time. Obviously the first goal is a gift, right? They, they can't play out of the back and yet they, you know, Middlesbrough tried to play out of the back all night, uh, pass out of the center back, center back loses it. Palmer's right there to take it, slots it in very coolly. And if you watch the behind the goal replay of this goal, fakes the goalkeeper two times before sliding it in, not the most easy finish in the world, and he did it. Uh, beautiful finish. Second one, just there, ready for Gallagher to cut it back and put it in. And, again, I, I look at this kid, and he is a kid. He's an absolute kid. 20 goal contributions this season. Wow. Young 21-year-old, Dennis. Wow. That's crazy. I can't even, like... The number is start jumps out at you because it just creeps up so quickly, but he's been exceptional, exceptional the entire season, man. Like, and 
I'm full disclosure. I, I'm gonna let, let it be known that uh, before we purchased him, I was all in for Elise. I wanted Elise. I thought that he was the perfect complement to what we'd already signed. And you know, you know, I spoke to a few people that had watched Cole Palmer play, and he's like, "If you want Elise, if you really enjoy what Elise does, you're really gonna enjoy Cole Palmer as a player." And everything that they've said is rung true. Like he's exactly the piece that we needed at the right time. And, you know, I don't think that as much as, yeah, they you say they gifted us that goal. I think that that goal just comes down from hard work again. We pressed them relentlessly mm-hmm. the entire first half. And, you know, that in and of itself is creating the turnovers for us to capitalize on. And we're taking them now, thankfully, finally. Right. But yeah, overall, this guy, I don't know if we, there's going to be, I mean, there's probably two people that you can probably say would be rivals for, um, you know, player of the season. He's certainly signing of the season at this point in time. Um, player of the season, uh, you could probably make an argument for him and Gallagher. But, I mean, in our ascendancy, when we're playing our best football, Cole Palmer is the one that is usually driving us and spearing us head, spearheading us on. So, you know, um, hats off to him for sure. Let me hit you with a couple other stats just for some funsies here. Dean CFC on, on Twitter. Uh, Cole needs one more goal and assist to equal Gabrielle Martinelli's best ever goal and assist tally in a single season. It's January 23rd. Um, just a heads up for Arsenal fans. I don't know why you'd be listening to this, but maybe you're that self-loathing. Um <laughs> Dan also uh, comments in <laughs> after this. We have this thread in, in WhatsApp, so I'm just reading these as we go. He has 45.5% of Kai, Kai Havertz's club total in just 23 appearances. Kai had 137. Uh, <laughs> Kai got nine goals in 47 games last season, uh, seven goals and assists in, in, in Cole's last four games. That's just his last four games. Uh, I mean, this is... It's outrageous, man. And, and like you think about it, he's already at 20 goal contributions a season. We have about 40% of the season to go, Brandon. What, what's that number getting up to? Um, for me. Ooh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm trying to look at like the schedule that's left. It's going to be tense. I mean, can I just say he's going to get up to one and a half trophies a season? <laughs> yeah okay you're throwing the over under <laughs> interesting um i'm going 35 total goal contributions this season that'd be immense but right that'd now that it's like huge outside of Nkunku, who's again mysteriously not healthy where else is it coming from so like he's on pens and everything else flows through him like i guess yeah i mean it's likely he can reach those numbers i, I mean He's just been the most consistent offensive player that we've had. Um, usually gives you about an eight out, eight or nine out of ten. But you know we've had other contributions. Obviously Jackson's at Afcon right now. He's been hit and miss, but he's scored when he's had to. You know he's got what eight or nine goals. I'm not sure. Um, Raheem Sterling again, another one of those guys that can frustrate the hell out of you because you can see him putting brilliant performances like he did today, and you can see other performances where he's just like. What what happened? Where did you learn your football? You know, what's going on here? But, you know, like, it's always, we're getting, I think that this game is a, a good good sign because it's showing that we can get contributions from other places other than Cole Palmer. Like, Enzo Fernandez is starting to come to the fore right now. We got a goal from DeSassi today. Probably could have had two. You know, if we have, if we have more, you know, more people contributing to the wins and losses here, I'm sure we'll be fine now. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't really come up. I don't really like to make like predictions about where a player can finish. But if I was, I don't think 35 goals and assists would be unheard of for a guy like that. Like he's, he's just been incredible. He's slotted in in that position, whether it be on the right or in the middle. And he's been, you know, like unplayable a lot of the time. So, you know, long may it continue. Well, you, you mentioned Sterling. Excellent on the night. Start on the right. Combined well with Palmer and DiSassi was involved in seemingly every attack on the first half. I was always worried that he's going to put his foot on the ball, slow it down. No need for that tonight. Found himself in good positions. Um, was back to his best. I think part of this is hedging Dennis, right? We are playing a mid-championship side. So, like, these are the chances to boost confidence. These are chances to maybe get away with things. Where in the Premier League, it is on a razor's edge whether or not something comes off or not. And he was obviously able to take advantage of that, which is, uh, it is a net positive. 
facts, 100% facts there. But I mean, you can only beat what's in front of you and you can only grow more in confidence with those performances, right? Like, you know, you beat, you finally beat a, a, an opponent that you should beat convincingly. I mean, obviously, Preston was another one that was probably of the same sort of like quality. But, you know, these performances are what breed confidence and young players, especially the ones, the teams that we the team that we've assembled so far need that, you know, week after week to just grow and grow and grow. And like, we, what have we been talking about? Like all season consistency. We've been talking about getting a consistent run of form. We wanted to use this period to get like four or five, six games on the trot where we're winning, because as we start to win more the confidence grows and the team starts to like really start re re hitting their stride and finding, you know, that next level, which we all want to see. So that's kind of where I see it. I know Nick, you've been banging on about that all year as well. Like just the whole idea of consistency and whatnot, you know, and yep. using these this period of time to, you know, address that. Yeah. I mean, n next one for me. And I, and I think he really stood out today because this is not his position. Typically is DSASI. Uh, looked like a young Reese James out there, just flying around, uh, bombing up and down the field, doing both sides of the the, the job, which is, is really difficult to do. We know how much strain is on that role when it's played correctly under a pot system. Um, and look, one goal, three tackles, three out of four ground duels, one. Um, you know, I, I don't think it was his best aerial night by any means, but uh, look, the goal was great, right? Intercepts the ball plays it forward to Palmer. Palmer plays it to Sterling. Sterling plays it back to him. Great finish. Uh, and I, I don't know what it is for, for you, Brandon. Maybe it's you feel the same as me. The roar upon scoring a goal from DeSassi just feels different. It feels uh, like a lion roaring to me. Like there's just this like extra punchiness to it uh, that, that maybe you don't get from, from cooler characters like Palmer. For sure. Hey, he's in uncharted waters, right? So for him to not get dribble pass on the right wing is huge. He didn't commit a foul, which is huge. And then he chipped in with all that uh, offensive stuff. Like, it's fine if you do the offensive stuff, but it can't be at the sake of the defensive side. And he did the defensive side and then got to add on top. So, again, I think, like, great night from him. Um, and he should be super happy. Again, these are confidence builders momentum builders for some of these players especially someone who he is obviously not at his most comfortable as a right back he can do right center back in a back three we saw that in monaco when we did the scouting pod um but this is different and he's he's working hard he's putting himself out there and trying to make the best and uh that was great but enzo almost like an eight today almost like uncaged a little bit dennis where no connor was there because connor usually plays higher I think the fact that we, if you look at the the average positions, it was literally four across the front line. Enzo had a huge box in the middle to play within. And obviously, Moy was never going to get it in his way. And the man no. cooked. Yeah, but I, I would say that even that his uh, his heat map was a little bit skewed too because after we took off Caicedo, he, he dropped out into that six role and it was more of a deep line playmaker at that point. So, I would say all throughout the first half, he was just as high as anybody else. We were pressed up the pitch very high. But, you know, this this for me is the Enzo that everyone is, wants to see, wants to see. Obviously, we're aided by the fact that we had the ball, what, 68 70% or something of that sort. And, you know, we're not really getting caught out in transition. I thought Caicedo had a fantastic game as well, just putting out there efficiently, economical, and just snuffed out anything like the fact that Bisasi was so comfortable with, you know, bombing up the pitch was because he knew Caicedo was there to compensate for any of the holes that he would leave behind. But Enzo in particular for me was just, this is the role you want to see him in. You want to see him have the freedom to, you know, maraud forward, get in the half spaces. He's the guy that when you get into those half spaces just outside the 18 and stuff like that, you want him on the ball there because he has the most depth touch. He can pick the passes and whatnot. And not only that, but like, as we saw today, he can finish. I know he hasn't really done it at a, an amazing clip, you know, uh, since he's joined Chelsea, but he has the ability and the technique to do so. So there's nobody better that you want in that advanced eight role than Enzo at the squad for me right now, in the squad for me right now. And he just showed that today. Um, everything that I saw from him was just, you know, exceptional. Even his defensive work when we needed him to just like, just hunker down and just block shots, intercept and whatnot. He was there for that as well. So 
again, just a great performance overall. Much like Chilwell, it's almost as if when you play him in his position that he performs. I don't know. We're, we're in this, like, you know, I agree. It's it's like Cole and Enzo are your eights. You know, Sterling Mudrick were your wingers. Broya is your striker. Caicedo is your holder. It's much more of a 4-3-3 in the way it plays for me than uh, anything else. And unshackled Enzo is a whole different Enzo. I mean, he he's looked like a man possessed the last two matches. I always worry about him injury wise and fitness wise. Can he keep this up? You know, he was lunging for a lot of balls today. I was getting nervous. Um, but you know, again, if he can play like that, we're going to win a lot of games because he is a, an actual difference maker. And, you know, let's, let's see if this advanced eight role, Brandon kind of is the catalyst for him to really start, you know, scoring more regularly that Chelsea has five goals to the bridge now. So feeling a little bit better. Love to see it. Obviously, it's the one thing we're like, all right, this would be great to round out his game, starting to find his form. Like I love it, Dennis said, the Lampard-esque late run into the box. Plenty of film on that, Enzo. Just tee it up at Cobham. Let it roll. <laughs> uh, Connor started on the bench. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of a surprise, but came on. Instant impact. The only thing that he missed was potentially scoring after that run right through the midfield. Two assists, 25 minutes. Not bad. Any concerns, Nick? I mean, just maybe rest for the guy. Didn't need him, so we didn't play him. Try something different. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're in this position now where it's, you know, I think he is six assists on the season for him. No goals yet, but, I mean, contributing in, in those ways. Uh, I, I think we only have three fit mid midfielders that are eligible to play on Friday against Villa. So you have to do some rotation. <laughs> and hypothetically, this was going to be the easier of the two games. So, you know, if you can get away with resting players, then that's what you do. I, I'd bet very good money that we see him play against Villa, um, maybe alongside Enzo, maybe in a three with Enzo and Caicedo to try and con control the midfield a little bit. But, you know, Two assists in five minutes, nothing to sneeze at. I think, again, Connor, contract issues, put that aside. I'm sorry, he's able to put that aside, Dennis, because he continues to go out and find ways to positively impact games in this team. Yeah, I, I mean, for me... Uh... To be honest, I think that this is the role that is, is that he's best in, you know, um, not in a, a dead match where the game is, is finished. But I, I think that when you're looking for when you need goals in the game and you need to be in a more attacking outfit, I think Connor is best suited to be coming off the bench in those situations. Like we have a lot of attackers. Obviously, he was he was favored. Uh, Mudrick was favored to him today. Uh, so if Mudrick wasn't playing, you probably would have Raheem starting on the left. And then, uh, you know, Palmer. Or was it Palmer on the right or something like that. Yeah. But, you know, he was favored to him today. He didn't really play well. We'll get into that, I'm sure. But, like, when I'm thinking about an attacking outfit, I think that, you know, Gallagher is best suited to be somebody that's more – how would I say this? Um, he, when you don't necessarily have to use his energy, it's best that you use somebody that's better with the ball, right? So, for me – Connor's strengths are he always plays with the effort and energy that you need to win football games. That's what you need to the baseline effort that you need to win and compete. And he always seems to bring that. The problems that I have with his game is that when you want to have like a little bit more, you know, incisiveness, one twos play off each other, playing behind, you know, recognizing where the runs are, playing it, playing it one first time and whatnot. He's not necessarily the best at that, but. You know, today was a, a great example of what I'm saying is the exact opposite. You know, like, obviously, gets to the byline, cuts it back, finds full Palmer, first-time finish. You know, then this, the, the second goal, he sets up Madweke, splits, you know, splits the back line, plays it right in, perfect through ball, he's in goal. So he is capable of that, but I, I really feel like more often than not, I would rather see him in that more when we need a game where we need to be compact tight win the ball apply i want to see him in those roles more so than when we have to score goals and we need him to be an, an offensive dynamo Here, here's a That's weird stat here's a weird stat for you though connor six assists on the season 
Enzo zero assists on the season. Enzo five goals yeah. on the season. Connor zero goals on the season. I don't know if I would have predicted that at this point, Brandon, because I, I think my brain would have gone more towards Connor scoring goals as he did kind of at the end of last season, Enzo being more of the creative playmaker, but they're kind of doing the opposite this year. Yeah, uh, I hear you. Um, it's we At the end of the day, we wanted more goals from the midfield. That was a huge thing going into this season. We're getting goals and assists. At least we're getting production. Uh, let's let them continue to find there. I mean, Connor's super unlucky. I mean, he just hit the post with the outside foot volley at the you know mm. before the break too. So like a little bit surprising. I think didn't Enzo miss a penalty early on in the season too? So mm -hmm. there's definitely been chances and things like that. Um, but so I, I I'm okay. Like I still think as a net hole, we are way ahead of where we were last season, and that is great. But um, it wasn't all roses on the day, so we, we can wrap up this because we haven't talked about Mudrick Nick, and he is catching f a more flack over his performance. Before it was, he's not a good sub. He needs time to get into it. Well, he only got 45 minutes, so um, talk about the halftime substitute. I mean, it was probably deserved. I mean, this has a especially um, poignant... Uh, <laughs> tones because we talked so much about him versus Sterling, which one was better, you know, before this match and uh, Sterling went out and played pretty well. And, and Mudrick decidedly did not, uh, did not look on the same page at all as anyone else. Chilwell obviously trying to help him just couldn't be helped. Uh, you know, Matawake replaced him, looked a lot more assured and confident, um, even gets his goal at the end. Um, I don't really know what to make of this, Brandon. I, I really don't. I, I I think there are a lot of people out there who are over the experiment, um, who maybe think that it was a gamble that, that just won't pay off. I don't know if I'm there yet. Um, but, you know, I, again, it's this is a championship side. Like, he should go out with you know, a player of his level capability quality you should go out and just dominate and just couldn't couldn't figure it out and I think I'm more worried about the positioning when to make the run when to give space some like the basic footballing tenets that we're not seeing and this is not just me this is a lot of people who I like and respect on on Twitter as well saying this and I, I just don't know what happens I don't know if he's going to be given a chance to, to go again or if he's going to be kind of sidelined for, for other options. Well, I think for his sake, no one can seem to stay healthy, so he's probably going to get chances by default, even if that's at uh, left wing back or right wing back because uh, everybody <laughs> has to take a chance, turn at that. You know, it's like when you're younger, Dennis, everyone has to play defense at least one shift every few matches. Not me. Um, Not me. <laughs> Mudrick's going to, I think, still find some minutes. It's still development. I, we all knew... And we all know he's not the finished article. He needs more coaching. He needs more time. How they find a way to get him that, we'll see. But the the thing is, he's got something that literally no one else has. And those physical abilities are unmatched and can be lightning in a bottle. It's, again, how do we harness it? How do we use it? Unfortunately, then it's against the championship side. It just it wasn't it today. It really wasn't. I really wish that you wouldn't mention that it was a championship side because that's just a really damning, um, you know, indictment for a guy that you spent what 67 million pound on plus add-ons. And, you know, it's just, it just goes to show you for me, I think you guys both hit it right on the head. I don't think that he's a bad player. I think that he's got raw skills and tools that can be utilized in the side but he just doesn't have a footballing brain yet. He needs to learn a lot. Like in truth, he should be playing U21 and then learning the game, you know, like at the high level, he should be playing the U23s, you know, and just learning the game, learning the tactics involved in playing high level football. And he's just not been afforded that because he has the skill set, like the actual technique and ability to play at a higher level. So when he was at 
you know, playing at a, in uh, in the Ukraine there, uh, they used him because he was a weapon, you know, but he wasn't learning anything about like how to really learn the game and apply himself the correct way. You know, tactics weren't very high, you know, so now he comes to a side like Chelsea where, you know, Poch is very demanding on what he wants on that left side. Of course, he doesn't just play anybody there. He plays Chilwell there because he knows Chilwell understands what he wants, you know, and he plays in this side and you, you see the whole match. It wasn't just Chilwell telling him where to be. It was Enzo telling him where he needs to be and stuff like that. Everyone that plays that same sharing the same side of the pitch with him is telling him where he needs to be to be effective. You know, go further, stretch the pitch, you know, come inside, pull your defenders away. So we have more room to get in behind. And these are things that, you know, instinctively you should be able to do as a winger. He's just not there yet. So I think it's just going to take a little bit more time. And hopefully by the end of the season, we'll start seeing somebody that has the tactical news to hurt teams because he has the, the tool, the weaponry to do it, but he just doesn't have the brain as far as I'm concerned right now. You're, you're right. In the sense of like, it didn't matter if it's a championship side or a Premier League side or a Champions League side. Mudrik plays on instinct, and right now he needs that to be shaped and formed. Uh, more on the training pitch again. Like, I'm not going to pass like final judgment, Nick. Like, again, like I've said, Mudrik has uh, a lot of room to grow. We give him time, and we've got time. My man's on a seven year contract. We're good. Yeah. Uh, but there were, uh, obviously, Matawiki came in, looked cool. So between him, Chuck Meka, some of the other players that got cameo minutes, saved the special one for last. Um, I don't know. It just kind of felt like everything went right today, and it was uncomfortably nice. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we can have nice things occasionally, which is great. Um, you know, Carnes, I love seeing getting some more minutes. Alfie Gokris, of course, got a huge roar uh, when he came on. Uh, and then JT uh, tweeting during the match, Castle dines a magnet in the box, and uh, and Leo Brandon gets his uh, gets his debut at home uh, for a whole nine minutes. Uh, massive shouts to Clayton Beerman who predicted to the minute and the score when Leo would come on. Uh, Clayton Beerman is a uh, is a vision for everybody else. Um, incredible, good for him. Goalie fifty nine does it again, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always does. Um, we got to talk to David Barnard earlier, I guess last year. Now we, we finally switched calendar years. It was last season and he literally told us a story for all of you that have missed it. It's on social clips about how he is, thinks he's like the only person to have got to do this, but he signed Castledine's dad at Wimbledon and now he signed Leo's first contract because he's 18 at Chelsea and now Leo goes on to make his debut and Leo is tearing it up right at the at the youth uh the youth group ages and then he finally gets his debut today gets more than the 90th minute sub as well that was exciting and special Dennis again because it wasn't a token sub like there were actual minutes to be played uh, for him to go run out there and break a sweat. And that, again, like having all this history and, again, more youth players coming through. Obviously, Phil, I talk with him tomorrow. He's going to be all excited about it. But, like, I guess what does it mean for you? Does it matter? Why is it important if it is? Yeah, man, these kids have to know that there is an opportunity for them to come through and make make it into the, you know, into the Chelsea squad, right? That's an important thing. You know, that's what you're working for. And, you know, the hard work that you put on the, tr the pitch just paying off, you know, the training pitch, it's important to have those, you know, those little bumpers in, you know. And I, I'm wondering, like, because I, I have so far I haven't figured out why we always have two goalies on the bench as opposed to just bring another player from the academy and come up and just play him, you know, just have him sit on the bench, hold that spot, you know, where we need. But I guess it's because they're trying to reward people that work hard in training. Right. So maybe we have two keepers that are working hard in training and that level that sort of like, you know, the the effort that you're putting in is being rewarded. Like you're getting a match day paycheck, you know, like you're on the bench, you know, something like that. So I don't know. But I, I, it's always good to see 
uh, young people get their opportunities to, you know, get on the pitch in a meaningful way. And, you know, same thing for Castellina. I'm glad he was able to get on. I, I didn't know. Honestly, I don't really follow the youth as, as closely as I should. I didn't know much about him. But apparently what I heard was, yeah, he has been tearing up trees uh, for the younger guys, which is, you know, great to see. And hopefully it will continue going forward. He can use this as a springboard to take him through the rest of the season. I, 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 it's again, great timing. Cause I knew I was recording with Phil and, uh, on Wednesday. So the fact that we got this, I was like, yes, we'll, we'll seal this one home with him. So don't worry, Dennis, more context, more praise tomorrow. But I always like to, to uh, highlight these and talk about, it. obviously it was cool. It's on our YouTube. Go check it out with the David Barnard, uh, part of our episode 1000 extravaganza, which is great. Um, man, what a lot. A lot has happened in this in this match. And it was usually we don't have this much of like hype stuff to talk about, but you know, uh we we were there. We didn't do Dan of the match, but we we had votes and we're all different. I'm Palmer. I put Palma. Dennis, you were Enzo and Nick Chilwell, which again, only 60 minutes, but I think the feel good of seeing him at that level was just like, oh, he's back. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think for, for the 60 minutes, he was on the pitch. He was the best player. He was all over the place. And it's giving me visions of when he was healthy and fit and doing it for us. Um, so, yep, chill well for sure. Man of the match. Care, care to, to make your case for Enzo, Dennis? Uh, I, honestly, I'm I'm very comfortable with all the selections here. Palmer could have easily been man of the match. I think the Sassy could have gotten a shot for man of the match. Uh, I chose Enzo just because it's we're finally seeing him, you know, in a role that he's comfortable in and he's producing like we thought he would. So, you know, just pulling the strings in the midfield, you know, being that sort of like box to box presence. He was able to drop back and play like the solo six role once Casado came on and did that effectively well as well. So, you know, I just thought he was really, really good. And this is the second performance on succession where I felt like he was really in his ascendancy. I think Palmer's the easy way out. But it also gave us a little bit of variety. Um, I love it when we have too many options to choose from this one. Uh, that That is the best way to have it. From here, we take on the winner of Fulham versus Liverpool. Liverpool with the lead, right? I think they're playing. I don't know where they're playing. I'm not going to pretend. But uh, it's Craven Cottage. I thought it mm -hmm. was. 90 minutes left. I think it would be fun to have a West, Le West London Cup final. But at the same time, like, Mr. George Smiley tweeted, death taxes and Chelsea Liverpool Cup final. So, you know, I think either way, we've got some revenge to do, Dennis, like you said, uh, you know, with Liverpool and Cup finals, but. To, to one aggregate to Liverpool. So Fulham have to overcome a one goal differential. Go put out of six, it. Go put six past them. It's easy. Just, <laughs> look, you, you guys got it. You're fine. I mean, Liverpool did bounce in their last result and, you know, um, Nunez was was involved in a lot. They still scored four without Mohamed Salah, but um, we'll we'll see. I, I, again, I think it'd be fun to be Fulham, but you know if it's Liverpool, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I think that we're going to go in feeling like we've got a swinging shot. Uh, but then this Friday we've got Villa as well in the FA Cup. Um, at Stamford Bridge, which is great. I was looking. There's some kind of like hilarious stats in here, um, but long story short. Overall in the competition, we're stacked. But Dennis, Villa have won their last two away matches against Chelsea, which is not great. And yeah. so we need to put a stop to this. Yeah, and let's do that on Friday, man. Uh, another cup, you know, at the bridge under the lights, I'm assuming, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. It's another opportunity for this team to just build on their, you know, growing character, their growing confidence and whatnot, and beating a very, very, very difficult side. You know, obviously, as you said, like Villa is in very, very good form right now. Um, obviously, they got like Ollie Watkins, who's just he scores a lot of goals. <laughs> He's, he will score some goals, so we got to be worried about him. But um, yeah, they have uh, they've been playing a, a really solid, solid way of playing football. They keep clean sheets. They got uh, Martinez and Net, and you know, we just got to be take the opportunities, take the grow the, the growing confidence that we have around this club right now and just take it into Friday. And hopefully, you know, we haven't expended or ex expended too much energy and we can go in and give them the same sort of energy that we did 
today and, you know, take it into the take it into the game against Aston Villa and take it to them. I mean, we said uh, this match on Tuesday, Nick, was the most important match of the season. Well, guess what? We've got a new most important match of the season because business has been handled. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, right? You think about if Chelsea win and beat Villa, you're on a serious roll then, right? You think about all the results that have happened really since December started and it started trending in our direction again. Um that would be a big one. I mean, they're third in the league. They've been playing really well. You have Liverpool, who's who's first in the league on you know the following Wednesday. Start stringing some matches together here. Again, you're you're only a few points off of of sixth place in the league too. I mean, momentum is is an absolute beast in sports. You've seen teams that are underdogs catch some momentum and go on to win things very easily and so let's just hope that, that chelsea take that momentum and move it forward i hope the bridge is just fucking hyped yes. on friday like massively yes. hyped i want to i want to beat these fuckers so bad so you can talk to matt law the next week brandon you have no idea let's go come on <laughs> so so love funny you, so virtuous as well coming from a, a, a place of being the bigger man i love it but that's what football's about it's all about fun and again I mean, this would really put to bed all of the the potch out and all of the like, concern and show that, like, hey, this is really building something. You and I already talked about it. Statistically, this team is night and day difference from what we saw last season. But anyways, uh, we're going to wrap. Dennis, a huge shout out. Thanks for jumping in midweek, uh, coming at us and, and joining the pod. As always, we appreciate uh, having you on, sir. Always humbled when you guys ask, to be honest, man. I uh, love talking football with you guys. And the more times it happens, the better it is for me. And look what look what we produce. Look what oh, we, yeah. I know Dan's not here. I know Dan's not here. And, like, you know, obviously we need him to be a part of this whole thing. But look what we produce. A 6-1, guys. Think about that for a second. 6-1. Pass me back. We'll see more performances. What, what are you doing Friday night, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Just book it now. Book it early. Get it in. Uh, it, it is good, good stuff. Check out Couch Critic on YouTube. Put out the videos. Uh, always appreciate it. Uh, putting the voice out there. But anyways, Chelsea fans, we got to wrap. Like I said, more content coming at you this week. We got a, an Academy update, which will be nice and spicy with Phil and special guests. Won't spoil it there. And then obviously uh, match on Friday. So anyways, we are done for the night. Hope you've enjoyed it. But until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high. To Wembley. <laughs>